Hey folks, welcome back. Um, so the last time that we were here, we were talking about Pavlov's very famous uh, classical conditioning experiment in which he had a dog uh, basically become trained to salivate to a tone. Sometimes this is also a bell, um, but in either case, we're taking a neutral stimulus that previously did not produce any salvation on its own, and by repeatedly pairing it with food, uh, we can basically train a dog to salivate to the tone on its own. So again, just as a reminder, food in this instance is our unconditioned stimulus. It produces a reflexive unlearned response. In this case, our unconditioned response, salivating uh, in response to meat. Um, our neutral stimulus, when repeatedly paired with our unconditioned stimulus, will then become a conditioned stimulus, which will produce a conditioned response. In this particular case, salivating in response to uh, the tone. So what's critical for all of this? And I've already kind of mentioned this, but I think it bears repeating. Um, so what's really critical for classical conditioning is you need to have some stimulus, an unconditioned stimulus that produces a reflexive response. So for example, a puff of air to the eye, that's going to cause you to blink and for your eyelid to close. But that's not something that you are actually trained to do. This is something that you do reflexively. Then, um, generally, one thing I will mention, the response to the unconditioned stimulus and a conditioned stimulus are ultimately going to be the same. In this case, with Pavlov's experiment, it's salivation. But what matters is what they are responding to will be different. Our unconditioned response is salivating in response to the meat. Our conditioned response will be salivating, but in response to the tone in this particular instance. So now we're gonna talk about a few different phenomena that are associated with Pavlovian conditioning or classical conditioning. We're going to talk about acquisition, extinction and spontaneous recovery, and then generalization and discrimination. And by discrimination, I am not necessarily talking about the kind of discrimination that we do to other people on the basis of um, different personal characteristics. We're talking about being able to tell the difference between two different stimuli in this case. So let's first start by talking about acquisition. So when we have a conditioned stimulus that then produces a conditioned response. This is a case of acquisition. This is when the association between our conditioned stimulus and our unconditioned stimulus um, is gradually formed. Now, here's what's kind of critical. So initially, the strength of the conditioned response will be really weak. But over time, with repeated pairing, as you can see in this figure, we will see the, um, the strength of the conditioned response begin to increase to the point where the conditioned response will occur right after the presentation of the conditioned stimulus. So the timing of when each of these occurs matters. Um, for you to be able to engage in classical conditioning, the conditioned stimulus needs to be able to predict the unconditioned stimulus. So in the case of lightning and thunder, lightning has to always come before the thunder, so we're able to predict when the thunder will arrive. It wouldn't work very well if the thunder came before the lightning. At that point, the lightning wouldn't be predictive of anything. Similarly, um, if we are presenting a tone and meat, we always want to have the tone presented before the meat. Uh, we actually need to make sure that um, the dog understands that the tone means that the meat will still arrive. So if you present them at the same time, like simultaneously tone and meat, they're less predictive. And if you present the meat before the tone, at that point, the tone's not really predictive of anything. And so when you have simultaneous presentation or a backwards presentation, um, you tend to not see um, acquisition and certainly not very strong acquisition. So 
now we have trained a dog to salivate um, to the sound of a tone. Ah, there we go. Um, now, what is going to happen if I only presented the tone, but I no longer presented food? In this case, this is a process that is known as extinction. So what will happen is that at least initially, um, you will get salivation in response to the tone on its own without meat. But at this point, the tone is no longer predicting anything. It's predicting that nothing is coming. And so what will happen is that we will see our conditioned response salivating in response to that tone decrease. So this is important. The conditioned response will eventually disappear. And so this leads people to wonder, uh, has the learning actually been erased? And a very resounding answer is no. We haven't actually erased the original learning. We've just inhibited it temporarily. So one of the things that researchers have done, and Pavlov himself did this, is, um, you introduce a rest period where you're not presenting the tone on its own or anything at all. And then after that rest period, maybe it's 12 hours, maybe it's a day, you reintroduce the tone. And what a surprise. When we do this, um, you can see that a little bit of the conditioned response comes back. Now, if we had erased the learning through this process of extinction and presenting the tone on its own without any meat. Um, if we erased it, it would not have suddenly come back the way it did. But in this particular instance, a period of being outside of the scenario and not being exposed to the tone actually creates what we refer to as a spontaneous recovery. So what happens is that after this rest period, we do see the conditioned response reappear when we present the tone on its own, which means we didn't erase it. We just inhibited it. I would also add that it's still somewhat inhibited because notice that the, uh, that the uh, conditioned response in spontaneous recovery does not have the strength that it had when we began that extinction trial. So that's something to keep in mind. So interestingly enough, our conditioned response can occur even with similar types of stimuli. And this is what's known as generalization. So one of the ways that Pavlov actually uh, learned about this was by pairing different uh, neutral stimuli with meat. So in some cases, it was a tone. In some cases, it was a bell. In this particular instance, it was a soft little pinch on the thigh of the dog. Um, and so the dog was basically trained to make an association between a pinch on the thigh, here indicated in red, and then, um, and then that was later tested by pinching other areas. So what's actually kind of interesting is that you can see that the strongest response is basically from the thigh. And that makes sense. Of course, we're going to get the strongest response from the thigh because that's the area that we actually did acquisition with. This is what we actually trained the dog to do. Um, but what you'll kind of find is that for areas that are near the thigh, like the hind paw and the pelvis, we do actually, um, and part of the trunk as well, so basically this whole back half, um, you do see somewhat of a conditioned response as well. As we get further from the thigh, especially as we get to the shoulder, the foreleg, and the front paw, you can actually see that the dog has learned that only areas that are near the thigh are acceptable stimuli, and areas that are nearer to the front of the body are not. So the dog generalizes this conditioned response to similar parts of the back half of its body. It also learns to discriminate between touches in the back half of the body versus those in the front half. So we can also discriminate between those stimuli. So discrimination in this case is basically differentiating or noticing a difference between two types of stimuli. So for example, maybe we present two different tone frequencies. So here we present a tone that's about 256 cycles per second or 256 hertz. And that's what the dog was originally trained on. 
and that dog will salivate and you will have that conditioned response. On the other hand, if I present the dog with a 392 cycle per second tone or 392 hertz, you get no salivation. So the dog has learned that certain tones are um, associated with the unconditioned stimulus, but this higher pitch tone is not. And as a result, the dog will not salivate. So one of the things that's kind of interesting, so obviously there are many, many different ways that you can look at classical conditioning in your own life. Um, and one of the most interesting applications that we've learned um, in everyday life is that we can actually learn a fear through classical conditioning. Um, so we will talk about this a bit more when we talk about some of the different psychiatric disorders or psychological disorders. A phobia is an acquired fear of an object or a situation. And as we'll talk about in December uh, when we're remote, phobia is different from a simple fear. So a simple fear would be like if I freak out in the house when I see a spider. Um, a phobia would be um, if I saw a spider in my house and I basically could not be in the house, I left the house, I had to run, like get in my car and drive five miles away because I don't even want the possibility of being around a spider. So often what we'll find is what separates a phobia from a simple fear is the intensity of the fear that we feel and additionally, the extent that we're willing to go to avoid dealing with that stimulus. Um, and let's be clear, phobias can be acquired in a variety of ways. We also know that there is a genetic component. Certain phobias do tend to run in families, but we can also thank a little bit of classical conditioning and that can potentially explain how these fears are learned. And this is where uh, John Watson actually comes in. And probably what John Watson is known for, um, probably more than anything else, is a very controversial study that he did uh, in the early uh, 20th century known as the Little Albert Study. So um, Little Albert is not actually the name of the child. Little Albert was basically the son of a hospital wet nurse. Um, and so, Watson thought it would be really interesting to see if you could modify how a child responds to objects that they wouldn't normally be afraid of, but then create that fear out of nothing. So he basically took this nine month old infant and he presented the infant with a variety of different objects. Um, if you actually look, they took videos of this. So they would present uh, the child with uh, different types of animals um, and like rabbits and rats and um, like fur coats and like a, a fuzzy Santa Claus mask. And the infant was not afraid of any of the objects initially. And that's going to become really important. We need a good baseline here. Um, basically, after exposing little Albert to these different objects, about two months later in the critical part of the experiment, um, little Albert was presented with a white rat. And as he was getting close to the white rat, uh, Watson basically would take a hammer um, and clang it against a metal bar that would produce a very loud sound. Now I would mention that he did this right behind the child's head and I could see um, many, 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 many different ways that this could have gone wrong, um, which is why you're going to hear me say this a lot. You could probably not do this study today. Um, but he basically paired the white rat with a loud noise. Now, infants are definitely afraid of sudden loud noises. And so um, he repeatedly would pair the rat with the loud sound to the point where little Albert showed visible signs of fear uh, to the rat and would try to escape the rat uh, whenever it was actually nearby. And what's actually really remarkable about the little Albert study is how much little Albert's fear generalized to similar stimuli. Um, so in addition to little Albert being afraid of a white rat, uh, little Albert was also uh, demonstrating fear to a rabbit. 
uh, to one of the researchers for coats, and even John Watson in this creepy Santa Claus mask. Now he fears even Santa Claus. Now, obviously, this is going to be a pretty critical situation with respect to ethics. Um, so one thing that you may not know about this study that does also make it pretty controversial is that they didn't actually try to reverse little Albert's conditioning. And that really violates one of the principles that we have um, with psychological research at this point. You want to try to return people to the emotional state that they were in before they came um, and took part in your study. And the researchers never actually did that. Um, and it's actually part of the reason why this research is so controversial. If you're going to create a fear in an infant, you should probably try to undo that fear when you get the opportunity. So how do we talk about this in classical conditioning terms? So, um, in this particular instance, uh, the loud noise is functioning as our unconditioned stimulus. Most people are reflexively afraid of or will startle to loud noises, and that is especially true for young children. So, our unconditioned stimulus is our loud noise, and our unconditioned response is fear or startling. When we repeatedly pair um, our loud noise uh, with the rat. Um, and by the way, I would add in this particular case, um, the rat came before the loud noise um, in this particular case. So this is a case where timing may not matter as much, but generally we always want our unconditioned stimulus to come first. In this case, it really couldn't. The rat had to be there before the loud noise was. So by pairing our conditioned stimulus, which was previously neutral, with a loud sound, we eventually get a fear response to the point where the rat becomes a conditioned uh, stimulus, then producing a conditioned response of fear. Now, if we present a stimulus that is similar to a rat, such as a rabbit, we will get generalization of that fear response as well. So how do you reverse that? And over time, I have had um, students ask me, you know, they didn't reverse um, the training with little Albert. So what would you do in those circumstances? So one of the things that was uh, proposed was by Mary Cover Jones in 1924. This is what is referred to as counter conditioning. So we created fear, um, Watson basically created fear. We didn't do it, Watson did. Watson basically created fear in a child by pairing a, a neutral stimulus with something unpleasant. So if you want to get rid of those negative associations, what you now have to do is pair uh, an object that you fear uh, with something pleasant. That could be candy, a sweet taste, a hug, pleasant music, or a variety of different things. Now, fear is a very quick learned response for us. Uh, negative information does tend to stick out more. I would probably imagine that you would have to have more trials of this pleasant counter conditioning than, um, than you did to get the negative. Um, conditioning and the fear to the rat. So it might take a little bit more work, but it can be done. Um, you can also utilize counter conditioning for people who are struggling with addiction, in particular addiction to alcohol. Um, so oftentimes people will have these very pleasant associations with drinking. You can basically utilize counter conditioning. In this case, uh, you give them a drug known as disulfiram or uh, sold over the brand name uh, Antabuse, and basically it will make them sick if they drink alcohol. So basically you take something that's very pleasant in terms of its associations, you apply this drug that makes them sick when they drink alcohol, they're going to associate those negative feelings associated with sickness to the alcohol and hopefully they're able to avoid it. So counter conditioning can work both ways. You can also use uh, what is referred to as systematic desensitization. So in this case, we pair progressive relaxation techniques to create a pleasant feeling and a pleasant mood, and we repeatedly expose the participant or the patient to the object to basically undo those negative feelings. Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and stop here.
Um, I feel like we're in a pretty good place to start part of Monday, uh, whatever we finish, uh, whatever time we have left from the experiment, and we can move on to this on Wednesday as well. So um, we will talk about operant conditioning next time. We will talk about rat basketball, and I will show you pictures of my cat. So I hope you are looking forward to that, and I will see you on Monday. See you later.